We're rolling. Vocal check one, two. Okay. So before I start the lab walkthrough, I want to just take a minute and call your attention to the, to the announcements. But the big thing that's coming up this week on Thursday, which is going to be the Cisco Career Bridge presentation. And I put a link at the top of the announcements. When you first go to WebAdvisor and see this course, it's the first thing you're going to see at the top of the screen. And they've got a new improved document on there. And when you open this document, you will see a web link to click on about a page and a half down. This Thursday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 2 to 3.30 is when it's scheduled for. To get an idea of what the career field is like in the CCNA market here, this is a local seminar here for the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Conditions right here. We're pretty strong here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Okay, we're not like the Rust Belt where all, everybody lost their jobs when they closed the steel plant. So we're in, and then there's another link for the bottom that you can sign up for right now that'll sort of give you a little background preparation. This is a little Cisco Networking Academy course. Same thing you go to take this course. And um, so those are right there where you can see that. Today's lab is under student lab printouts, and it's the lab 5.1.2.8 viewing network MAC addresses. I'm going to do a quick walkthrough of that now, and I'm going to augment it a little bit with using two PCs instead of one PC just to illustrate this idea that we talked about in the lecture, which is, which is the MAC addresses of PC show up in the MAC address table of a switch they're connected to. That's how he keeps track of them. Andy, having a problem with your hardware? Oh, is it that second display? It, after I do a walkthrough, I'll help you with that. I can usually plug in, plug it, and make it come back to life. It's made by Dell. Oh, we have a contract with them. Oh, yeah. Okay, we use all Cisco devices in our network, and we use all Dell devices in our servers and, and workstations. Okay, so I'm going to, first of all, go to, he tells you in the lab, uh, I've done all the connectivity for you here. But he says, um, so on page two of the lab, it says cable the network is shown. I've done the cabling for you because I can't allow you guys to get your grubby, grimy germs on the cables. And then step two, configure the IP address for the PC. So I'll, I'll do that right now. So let me see. I'm going to minimize my uh, web browser. And I'm going to go to PCA. And I have a, sh have a shortcut I put on the screen. Of course, you could type start run ncpa.cpl, or you could type start. Programs, etc. You can go there's seven different ways to do everything in Windows. But on these VMs that we use, I've got this thing called Cisco Lab Shortcut. And if you click on that, click on Properties, it'll take you right to the Network Control Panel. And um, I've got it set to the default. But I'm going to use the information on the front page lab here. And he says that PCA, this is PCA. You just do the lab yourself. You just have to do the PCA part. I'm going to use a PCB also just to make it a little richer experience for you. So we're going to set this to be a certain IP address, and the chart is given to be 192.168.1.3. Press the tab key. He fills in the default subnet mask for you, the so-called slash 24. No fair. We haven't talked about slash number yet. 255.255.255.0. We haven't talked that much about IP addressing yet. We're still on the uh, dead link there. And then we're going to put in the 192.168.1.1 default gateway value. 1.1 is the traditional address we give to the default gateway you're referring to the router. There's no router in this lab. You could leave that blank and the lab would still work perfectly well, but I'm just doing it so it matches what he put there. And I'll click OK and I click the second OK and then click Close. And just to verify, I'll bring up that little DOS prompt and type IP config. And it looks like it took. Sometimes on these VMs it doesn't take and we have to kind of slap them around and slap some sense to them and make it work. Now I'm going to add this. This is not in the lab. I'm going to add a second PC. I plugged the first PC into port number six, just like it has on the first page of the lab diagram. And I'm going to have to plug the second PC into port 18, where we traditionally put the second PCB uh, in these labs. So I'll go to PCB, go to the shortcut, give me the shortcut. And I'll just give them a compatible IP address 192.168.1. about four? As the first one was three, I'll just make this one four. And just to prove what I said was right, I'm not going to put the default gateway value in there. It's going to work just fine. There's no routers in this circuit. And like Reagan said, trust but verify. It looks like it took that setting okay. I'll go back to PCA for now. So he's telling us to do something, something that, that cannot possibly work. He says, from the command prompt on PCA, Ping the switch address. Well, what is the switch address given on the first page of the lab? So I'll type the command ping. Focus. Ping. 
192.168. Isn't it 1.2? It's 1.2. What's going on? Is it ARP? No, usually after ARP, the first one fails and then it does it. Why can't he ping the switch yet? I haven't configured the switch yet. The switch is in this default configuration. So he's saying, are the ping successful? Heck no. We haven't configured the switch yet. There's nothing for it to reply to. The switch is physically plugged in. We're going to do that in the next step, step three. So now we're ready to go and configure the switch, and then it'll fine. So here's my Terry term. Before you ever start operating with the switch, you need to make check and make sure that uh, it has the default configuration. And on the switch, there's two things we have to check for that. Okay. So. Sometimes when, it has, when sometimes it'll come up and it'll put that paragraph that says, do you want to go into the setup routine? And you always answer no to that. But let's prove that the switch has no existing configuration. I will check the two things. I will promote myself to the privilege exec mode, and I did not require a password because no passwords have been set yet. This is a completely clean switch. And I'm going to type the uh, uh, show flash command. I'm looking for the presence of a file called vlan.dat. It's not there. Had it been there, I would have had to erase it. Delete VLAN that, that center three times. As an alternative to showing DIR flash or show flash, you can type the command DIR, like the DOS DIR, show me the list of the files, and it works just the same. Okay, now let's show if there's any startup configuration in the NVRAM. No. This is a fully clean and erased switch. I can go ahead and start doing my lab, and it should work okay, and I don't have to worry about, oh, a common problem is the advanced Cisco people put weird lab VLAN assignments in there, and you plug your things in, and they should be connected to each other in a default switch. They would work, but because of the previous configuration that you did not, you neglected to remove, now they're not connected to each other anymore. And you're tearing your hair out thinking, oh, what did I do wrong? No, it was the other guy. Those arrogant advanced Cisco students, they're so arrogant and smart, they don't think they have to erase the switches. So that's why you need to check and see every time you use it, because we share the class with the advanced Cisco students. Okay, I'm going to do the step three configuration now and put a little bit of configuration on the switch. I'm in the I'm in the privilege exec mode. Now I'll do the global configuration command and take myself to the global configuration mode. And the first thing he says to do, which I agree with, is give him a meaningful host name S1. And now. That next command, no IP domain lookup, that's just, you don't have to do that. But if you do it, if you make a typing mistake, you won't hang it up for two minutes. Because if you don't put that command, he assumes there's a DNS server somewhere, you can look up a command, look up a server name, and if you mistype a command like shoe instead of show, he thinks, oh, I need to look up the server shoe. And he sits there and he hangs you up for a couple minutes, and it's, it's, it's irritating. So that, that prevents that. Now we're going to apply the management address to the device. So I'll say interface VLAN 1. That's the management address, or the SVI, the switch virtual interface. And we're going to give them that IP address that was present at the front. Wasn't it this? Wasn't it 192.168.1.2? Yeah, that's it. And then we need to activate the management interface with the no shutdown command. And wait for the Cisco noise to pop up. Pow, pow, pow. It's going to pop up here. Something brought up and up. We, go. we always get Cisco annoyances here. Now, he says, oh, I want to check and make sure that that took properly. He doesn't tell you to do this, but I'm going to type the command show IP interface brief, and it looks like it was set properly. It has the 192.168.1.2 up there. It's up and up. Layer 1, physical layer is up. Layer 2, data lake layer is up. Good, good, good. And port 6, that's what my PCA is plugged into. It's up and up. The link light is on. And I plugged the second PC, PCB, into port 18. 18 is up and up, too. I just added that to the lab. You don't have to do the first one. And the alternative command that I like is show protocol. Let's see if this works on the switch. Oh, it doesn't work on the switch. It only works on the routers. Okay. Now we're going to go to back to PCA. PCA. And I'm going to see if I can ping 192.168.1.2, which is that switch management address. So the normal thing happened here. The first ping did not work because of this address resolution protocol ARP 
thing. So I asked the PC to ping the switch, and the PC had no record in his memory, in his ARP cache, of what the PC, uh, about the switch management address, what the MAC address was that. Because in order to do a ping, I take the ping request and put it in the Ethernet frame. And in order to make an Ethernet frame, I have to know the destination MAC address of the thing I'm trying to ping. So I say, calling all stations, send a broadcast. If your IP address is 192.168.1.2, sorry to shout to everybody in broadcast. Please reply to me and tell me what your MAC address is so I can put my ping request, the SEMP echo request, in the Ethernet frame and send it to you. That causes the first one to fail. And if we look again, it works just fine. So if we do this command ARP A on a PC workstation, it shows me that address has been stored in the cache memory. It'll hold on to it. it holds on to it for about three to five minutes and then it'll erase it. Now I'm going to try this from workstation B also. Ping 192.168.1.2. So the same thing happened. And now just for fun, I'm going to ping from B to A. 192.168.1.3 was workstation A. So workstation, all the workstations can ping each other. The switch can ping everybody. Everybody can ping the switch. So the pings are successful. Now, in the next step, he's having us look at some of these uh, addresses. So let's go to PC, go back to PCA. We're still at the command prompt. And before, when I did IP config, that's the abbreviated command. It just shows you basic information. It just shows your IP address. But I'm going to do the command IP config space forward slash all, which gives us the whole enchilada a MAC address. Piece IP config by itself doesn't show you a MAC address. It just shows you your IP address. But IP config slash all shows you a bunch of extra uh, augmented information, including the MAC address of this PC. So he has, says, what is the OUI portion of the MAC address for the device? I'm allowed to highlight here. Am I allowed to highlight? Oh, I'm allowed to highlight. Okay, I'm going to do it on the screen. Okay, because some of us will be doing this later in the recorded presentation, and they can't see me wave my hands. I'll have a camera, just a microphone. So that first part's called the organizational unique identifier. That identifies the vendor. In this case, it's the vendor of the network interface card, which is probably going to be associated with Bell. And then the serial portion number is the port portion that's after that. So in other words, oops. Bell was given the prefix 000C29, and then they were allowed, able to use the last 24 bits of the, of the MAC address like a serial number. So 2 to the power of 24 is, oh, it's like 4.5 million or something like that. They can make several million devices, and then they can go back and get another OUI from the IEEE, another $1,500 for that. So that's just a few cents cost. You prorate that $1,500 over 4 million NICs, that's just a few pennies for, for the licensing cost. And the IEEE coordinates this. We don't want any duplicate MAC addresses ever to exist in the universe, because if two NICs ended up in the same room, the same exact MAC address, it would break the IP. It would give us big problems. It would cause Microsoft to put up that message on the screen. I'm taking my toys and going home. It would affect a duplicate MAC address that is not allowed. Okay, um, so that was the, the vendor that manufactured this NIC. It's Dell. We use Dell machines. Now let's look at the MAC address for the Serial port, I'm in the serial port, S1, S1 port. We're going to use a show command, show interfaces, VLAN 1. So what is our MAC address for VLAN 1? Let me see if I'm allowed to highlight on this one. Allowed to highlight? Oh, I am I allowed to highlight, okay. So there is the, the MAC address, the physical burn-in address for the switch. It's another MAC address. So if you look at that prefix, 5061BF, and it's a Cisco switch, who do you think the organization is that's been assigned to? Well, Cisco got that. They paid the $1,500 for the IEEE. They got that number. What does it mean here when it says BIA? Burned-in address, Ethernet. Adapters, 
have the a MAC address burned into them. It's like a read-only memory chip. So you're not supposed to be able to change it. Now, the hackers tell me on Windows machines, they can go into the Windows registry where the burned in 48-bit physical MAC address of that NIC card that's on that Windows machine has been stored, and they can change it to something else. Now, I can't think of any good reason why you would want to do that unless you were trying to be devious and try to hack somebody. Okay, but you can do that if you do change stuff in software. The so burn-in address, BIA stands for burn-in address. So the burn-in address, now we can actually change. There's actually a command on the Cisco switches and routers to change the MAC address. Now here's a legitimate use for that little trick. In a later course, we're going to study something called MAC address security, where the switch memorizes, you know that the switch memorizes your MAC address. Okay, and we can actually tell the switch, Memorize the legitimate MAC address of the Dean's computer, and if someone else gets there into the wiring closet and unplugs the Dean's computer and plugs in their hacking device, it will not have the right MAC address, and the switch port support security will turn off that port and not allow him to jack with the company network because he's probably a corporate opposition spy from Dallas Community College or something like that. So we're going to have a lab where we change the MAC address and trigger the security violation, so you can see how it works. But that will come up that'll come up in the spring. You come back and take my courses in the spring. Um, Oh, yeah, I've mentioned that to you guys already, I think, in the, in the presentation. Um, when you come back in the spring, if you want to come back in the spring and take the courses, um, sign up for CCNA 3 in the first eight weeks, CCNA 4 in the second eight weeks. I'm also teaching the CCNA 1 and 2 courses. And in the spring, what you're taking now is CCNA 1 will be offered CCNA 2. And CCNA 1 is now being turned into AB Cisco. Introduction to introduction. But you don't have to take two. Just take three and four. The Cisco Network Academy has been remapped into three eight week courses now instead of four eight week courses. So just as if everything let's 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 keep on going as if everything was going really well. Come back in the spring in the first eight weeks in January, take my Cisco three class. It'll be on Tuesdays and Thursdays at nine o'clock. We'll have the lectures on Tuesdays at nine o'clock. We'll have the labs on Thursday at nine o'clock. And then continue on, and then in May you'll be ready to get your DCNA cert. You don't have to take it from me. You can take it on other campuses if you want to. But we're all doing this in concert now. All the community colleges are slowly. Cisco really, you know, put this bombshell on us real quick. In academia, we don't move fast. We move. I will describe it as glacial. We move very slowly. But we're going to slowly. We're going to get new course numbers. And, and and it'll start making sense after they change the course number. Now the next thing is uh, Mark Grant Modoff. Okay, let's look at the show ARP command. And I probably talked too long and it's faded. Okay, it's still there. So oh, here you can see, I better highlight this for the people that are watching the recording or watching the transmission here. So here's here's this this device, this switch is this device. This is his MAC address right here. This is PCA, PCA's MAC address and IP address. So this command shows you the IP address and the corresponding MAC address all at the same time. Now, the MAC address table. Oh, yeah, I thought this whole chapter was about the MAC address table. I'm finally getting around to that. So I'm going to show the MAC address table. And ignore all these static entries. But here we see some dynamic entries. Here we see my PCB is plugged into port 18, and there's his MAC address. And my PCA is plugged into port 6, and there's his MAC address. Now, when you do it, you'll just have the 6. You just, you just, the lab just calls out for you to PCA. I just did the PCB just to... Show a little bit more. So the reflection question says something like, can you have broadcast at the layer two level? Absolutely. We need broadcasts. Broadcasts are a function of networking when a client machine is calling out for help and he doesn't even know who can help him yet. Okay, so if you're driving, you go, help, help, I don't care who saves me, somebody save me. You're broadcasting, yelling a call for help. So PCs, host machines generally have two things they need to broadcast for help for. First one is, please, Mr. DHCP server, grant me an IP address. I just booted up. Because in the majority of the world, we use DHCP. We don't statically set the addresses on our PCs. Second thing is an ARP request. It's been more than three minutes. I have forgotten the ARP address of the mail server, and I'm trying to log in and check my mail. Please send out this call. Uh, calling all stations. If your IP address is 10.1.2.3, that, maybe that's the mail server. The mail server will reply and tell you what its MAC address is, and then I can put my login request in an Ethernet frame with his actual 
is called MAC address. Not the all Fs. Switches do not learn broadcast addresses. Switches only learn real actual MAC addresses. So we can have. So what is the MAC address of a broadcast? I didn't really emphasize it much, Jen. It's all ones. We're in hexadecimal. F F F F F F F F F F F F. Twelve Fs. One hexadecimal F is equal to four binary ones. We just use hexadecimals until so that we don't have to look at binary digits. Too hard on the eyes. Our eyes are used to, to, numeric, to numeric numbers in ABCD and F. So why would I need to know, he says, why would I need to know the MAC address of a device? Well, if I'm going to send him a client request or a login request or a ping request or anything, I need to know its physical MAC address so I can create the Ethernet frame. I know my own MAC address. It's burned into my ROM memory. I have no problem filling out the source address part of the Ethernet frame. But I might need to relearn or learn for the first time the destination MAC address of the workstation I'm trying to talk to. And if it's not in my ARP memory anymore, I must broadcast the ARP request, relearn it, or learn it for the first time. And then I can create that ping request or that login to the server request and send it to them. Okay, hold on, I'll stop recording. Where's my mouse? I have two mice up here. <laughs>